Hi, this is Dr. Ruscio, and what is the best test for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO? And small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is exactly what the name implies, is a excess of bacteria in the small intestine. This has been correlated with IBS to varying degrees, but there's definitely a trend showing a correlation between IBS irritable bowel syndrome and SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And the symptoms of IBS, gas, bloating, abdominal pain, altered bowel function. And there may also be a correlation with things like reflux and just general indigestion. Now, continuing further, why is SIBO and potentially its connecting point IBS relevant? We know via the gut to other area of the uh, body connections, gut brain, gut joint, gut skin, that IBS may correlate with fatigue and depression as one example. And we know that some therapies for SIBO may also help with various skin eruptions and potentially even joint pain. Some other evidence is correlating to a greater or lesser degree small intestinal bacterial overgrowth with metabolic imbalances like being overweight, having higher blood sugar and cholesterol. So not a surprising contention to put forth that imbalances in the gut, in this case SIBO, may correlate with a myriad of various symptoms and conditions. And this is why it can be very helpful to have a diagnostic test to tell you, yes or no, I have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now, this is not the only ailment in the digestive tract, but if one is going to pursue testing, then it begs the question, what is the best test for SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? And thankfully, a meta-analysis, which is a summary of all of the available high-quality data, has been published to give us a definitive answer as to what is the trend line in the data regarding what is the best test for SIBO. And here is the meta-analysis. I'll put the abstract up here on the screen entitled, Breath Test for Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth, Diagnosis, a Systematic Review with Meta-Analysis. Now moving to their results section, this is really, really where we get to the meat of the matter, what is the best test. And let me just preface this by saying that the two most practical and clinically available tests are two different types of breath tests. These are breath tests where before the breath test, someone either drinks a glucose solution or a lactulose solution. So breath test, probably the best test, but then it begs the question, what type of breath test should you do? And this is where there is debate regarding is lactulose better or is glucose better? And the results of this meta-analysis, the pinnacle of scientific evidence, points to the answer. And here I will quote their results. GBT or glucose breath test showed a, sens a, a sensitivity excuse me, of 58% and a specificity of 83%. Juxtapose that with the LBT, the, the lactulose breath test, which has a lower sensitivity at 42 and a lower specific specificity at 70. Now, regarding sensitivity and specificity, we should just die, uh, you know, um, detail or define what these mean. Sensitivity tells you if you correctly were diagnosed with a condition and specificity tells you if you were correctly found not to have that condition. Now this is relevant, in my opinion, this is very relevant because one of the things I've grown increasingly concerned about in some of the natural health communities is the degree to which patients are being incorrectly diagnosed with SIBO and subjected to unnecessary fear, dietary restrictions, and treatments of various sorts. Things in the field are getting better as we are enhancing our understanding, but I think it's fair to say, unfortunately, that there are a number of patients out there who have been told they have SIBO when they likely do not. And this is likely because the lactulose breath test, while it can be helpful and in the hands of a astute clinician can be used correctly, actually does suffer from higher false positives. And that is why when we look at the meta-analysis data here, we see that the glucose breath test actually has better scores for sensitivity and specificity, meaning it correctly diagnoses those who have the condition and it correctly tells you that you do not have the condition and those who do not have the condition. The lower scores that you're seeing for the lactulose test 
informs that it is not as accurate of a test. People who do not have the condition are more often told that they do have it, and people who do have it are more often told that they do not have it. So this is, is pretty damning evidence for the lactulose breath test. It can be used, um, and there's one caveat here I'll, I'll come to in just a moment, but let me read the conclusion of the researchers first. Breath tests do not show excellent performance in comparison to the gold standard. However, keeping into account that SIBO is being I'm sorry, that SIBO is a benign disease that in most cases requires a simple antibiotic therapy, they can be considered as a surrogate test to replace the invasive one. So essentially what they're saying there is the SIBO breath test is not perfect. However, given the fact that the gold standard test involves a endoscopy and sampling of fluid from the small intestine, which is quite invasive and really can't be done in routine clinical practice, the breath test, albeit imperfect, is probably the most justifiable test. Continuing, in this context, the glucose breath test has a better sensitivity and specificity than the lactulose breath test, and therefore should be preferred. So this is the conclusion that the meta-analysis has reached. And now my, my caveat here, and this is more so my opinion, but I think this is what the research will eventually come to bear out, one of the challenges with the lactulose breath test is in the time interpretation of the test. So I'll put up here on the screen what a typical SIBO breath test looks like. We have readings at zero and then usually every 15 or 20 minute uh, intervals from there, usually 20 minutes, most labs will use a 20 minute interval. And so we have zero, 20, 40, 60, 80, and, and so on. Now, it's important when looking at the lactulose breath test to identify at what point you should identify that you're no longer seeing the small intestine, and I'll put up here the, the preferred window, is really 80 to 90 minutes. If you want to be extra liberal, you could, in my opinion, go up to 100 minutes. But when we get to the 80, 90 minute point, that's when we're starting to come up on the transition in many cases to the large intestine. Why this matters is because if you see the gas levels go up in the large intestines, that is actually normal. Now, unfortunately, the SIBO lab analyzers haven't really caught up with this interpretation just yet. So it's incumbent upon a clinician to make this interpretation, whereas the lab machines will oftentimes use 120 minutes as the cutoff. So people who are having an elevation at 100 minutes, at 120 minutes, uh, and if you're, if a, and if a provider is, is uh, really kind of liberal with their diagnosis, perhaps even at 140 minutes, if elevations there are seen, sometimes erroneously, a patient is told that they have SIBO. So if you're more judicious with the time window you're looking at with a lactulose breath test, in theory, you can mitigate this false positive. And again, why this is important, let's say you have some symptoms, you've seen a provider, you've done the lactulose test, and now you've been told you have SIBO. Well, if the only time you're seeing a significant elevation over, uh, significantly over 10 for methane or significantly over 20 for hydrogen, so that might mean that your methane needs to be, I, I would say, higher than 20, and your hydrogen needs to be higher than 40, these significant elevations toward uh, that 80 to 90 minute, that would make you positive. But if you don't see that until a bit later on in the test, after 100 minutes, then that would be a false positive and not something for you to be concerned about. Now, albeit this is getting a little bit nuanced, but why this is important is again, because there will be a number of patients who will show this positivity towards the end of the test. And many of these patients actually do not have SIBO. Now, to play devil's advocate here, I can't say definitively that every one of those cases will not benefit from therapy, and, and that's kind of a different question. Um, but back to the issue at hand, with a SIBO breath test, if you're using lactulose, it's important to not be overly liberal in throwing around a diagnosis, especially if the only elevation of gases is seen towards the end of the test. The nice thing about the glucose test is it seems to protect against that false positive. 
So again, pardon the, the, the level of detail here, but I feel this is very important for patients to understand because unfortunately this, this ump it hasn't seemed to permeate the SIBO community. And while I would assume any provider has the best intentions with vectoring a diagnosis, it does seem that patients are being told they have SIBO when they don't. And why this is a problem is because it subjects people to unnecessary fear, worry, and potentially dietary restrictions and treatments. Now, all this being said, the overall utility of SIBO breath testing, I think, is moderate. It can be helpful, it can help to steer decisions, but it's not the end-all be-all. And there are probably, loosely said, as many things that can go awry in the gut that we can test for, that we can't test for. And just as a, as a point here to reinforce this, we know that SIBO exists. We also know that small intestinal fungal overgrowth exists. And this is something we've talked about in the podcast before with Dr. Satish Rao, who's at uh, University, I believe, of, of Augusta. And we know that CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, does exist. However, routine testing is not available for that. So um, right there we see, well, we can test for about half of the imbalances we know exist in the small intestines, which is why I, I don't think it's in the best interest of a patient or in the best interest of a provider to overly harp on testing. We can use testing as part of the informative process to determine what may be going on underneath the hood with a given individual. But we can also use many a therapy without needing any type of lab results. Probiotic, as one example, can be quite effective and helpful for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. We've discussed now five clinical trials and one minute analysis showing that probiotics can be an effective treatment for SIBO. You don't need a breath test to use a probiotic for SIBO or for your IBS symptoms. And the same likely applies for CFO, knowing that probiotics also have antifungal effects. The picture I'm trying to paint here is that testing can be helpful. It is imperfect. Of the SIBO breath tests, the better is the glucose test. Although with a well-trained clinician, a lactulose test could be responsibly used. All that being said, I wouldn't go through um, large lengths to perform testing if you haven't yet tried to improve your diet, tried to use probiotics, potentially carefully used um, herbal antimicrobial therapy, consider elemental dieting. All the things that I've laid out in Healthy Good Healthy You can really lead to quite a bit of improvement, which has been evidenced by the number of individuals we've spoken with who've seen numerous doctors and not recovered their gut health and then gone through the simple protocol laid out in the book, Healthy Gut Health You, and seen the results they're looking for. That's an testament to the fact that copious testing isn't necessary in most cases, but rather having a well-constructed clinical stepwise process that's very evidence-based and scientifically informed can actually work better unfortunately, in many cases, than seeing a clinician. Now, there's certainly a time and a place for a clinician, and I do not want to dissuade anyone ever from checking in with their family doctor, their gastroenterologist, and going through the appropriate evaluations. However, that said, if you've had the appropriate evaluation and you're still floundering, then Healthy Good Health You really does seem to offer some nice benefits. It's really a derivative of what I do in the clinic combined with a pretty strong evidence-informed review. So in any case, coming back to the issue at hand for SIBO testing, the two best tests that are readily available are both breath tests, a glucose test and a lactulose test. And thankfully, we now have gold, um, you know, level, gold standard level evidence that the meta-analysis has found, and that points to the glucose test as being the best. So this is Dr. Ruscio, and I hope this information helps you get healthy, get back to your life, and if you do perform the SIBO breath test, be able to choose the one that is probably in your best interest.